Uh, hi guys, and this is Aditya Aluwalia from Finstructor, and uh, we'll continue our discussion on the ESG market and the various stakeholders. So we studied asset owners first, and next uh, we will move on to asset managers and understand the role that they play. So asset managers essentially select the securities and create a portfolio for the asset owners. And of course, they will influence the ESG characteristics of the portfolio by choosing which companies they decide to invest in and also engaging with the investing investee companies so as to improve the ESG performance or make sure making sure that the companies uh, are moving towards the goals of sustainability. So generally, they will react to the asset owners preferences and interests in ESG. But they can also play a key role in proposing newer products and newer approaches of considering and incorporating ESG into the security selection and uh, other processes. So asset managers are considered to be central in the investment value chain. Now, these offerings generally originally began with active listed equities, but recently have evolved to many other classes. The knowledge that was gained from equity valuation was then transferred to fixed income investments. And um, note that fixed income securities are issued by non-corporates also. So it's not just companies, but even governments, municipalities, supranational institutions like the World Bank also issue bonds. So analysis of these uh, institutions, these governments from an ESG perspective also started getting incorporated along with fixed income. Um, and then uh, over the past 10 years, we've seen the rise of green bonds, uh, that is investment in bonds of companies that are towards uh, uh, sustainable production or renewable energy, etc. Uh, has further propelled fixed income as an asset class of interest for responsible investors. Uh, infrastructure real estate private equity have been a bit slow, but also are catching up, uh, especially in uh, impact investing funds. And uh, more and more, we are seeing that uh, we are having indices and passive funds um, with ESG integration uh, uh, that are uh, available. And this came 20 years after the active um, in investment management industry incorporated ESG. But nonetheless, we have indices today that uh, track or that are ESG focused or that can help invest uh, passively in companies uh, that score well on ESG. So there are over 1,000 ESG indices and um, ESG factors we know have also been successfully integrated into factor investing, smart beta funds and derivatives, reflecting that even um, complex products are seeing penetration of ESG factors and, and ESG investing. Uh, so um, asset managers play a critical role as we've discussed, and we particularly note that asset managers who, will, who, who wish to differentiate themselves are offering significant enhancements in ESG related resources. So some have acquired asset managers who specialized in ESG. Others are investing a lot of um, uh, uh, money in technology using data science to develop their own scoring systems and dashboards. Practically every asset manager of, of size is doing this, uh, having some sort of an internal system or trying to develop an um, internal system. And many have, uh, uh, have built proprietary systems and they've expanded or invested a lot into human resources also with some investment teams just responsible investment teams uh, of over 20 people within the firm so so it's a big commitment and more and more asset managers are incorporating and investing more in esg Some of the challenges faced by asset managers in integrating ESG include first a lack of clear signals from the asset owners that they are interested in ESG. So if the asset owners don't mandate it. Asset managers may not follow ESG because their first job is to follow the mandate given to them by the asset owners who are the eventual owners of the investments. Secondly, similar is, is, is the issue that there's a narrow interpretation of investment objectives. So risk and return is defined in very financial metrics and does not often include climate or sustainability or impact or ESG factors. So if the investment objective is just risk and return or, and if it's over a one year period or two year period, then again, um, you know, asset managers may not be able to incorporate ESG factors which will show up in the long run performance or which are more longer term. So again, the narrow interpretation of risk and return or investment objectives by the consultants uh, on, on the asset owners is another issue. And finally, there are resource challenges. Uh, again, 
oftentimes ESG investing is seen as a separate from the other investing that the firm is doing or the other products that they have. So then they need a separate marketing or separate compliance department and separate investments in the tools and research and resources for ESG investing, which um, will be additional cost, especially if ESG is not entirely integrated into the firm. So yeah, these are some of the challenges which are being overcome and ESG is increasingly being incorporated into the processes of the asset managers. Uh, the next um, class of stakeholders that we will study are the fund promoters, another important class. And these are investment consultants, investment platforms and fund laborer, uh, label, labelers that uh, we will talk, to, talk about. So first is investment consultants and retail financial advisors. Now, ensuring that these consultants and advisors incorporate ESG into their service or into their core service provision is, is, is very important. So these groups are considered as the gatekeepers for the expansion of ESG investing as they will advise the asset owners and individual investors who will oftentimes accept their advice with little hesitation. So of course the aim is that these consultants and advisors very well understand the implications of ESG on long-term investment performance and um, the requirement of uh, incorporating ESG and the benefits of incorporating ESG. And uh, recent reviews have found that most consultants are failing to do this and they're failing to consider ESG in their investment practice. And one of the issue is again, uh, as the issue we discussed with the challenges faced by asset managers that um, the interpretation of investment objectives is very narrow. So they're again looking at risk and return over a shorter term or, or, or it's just financially defined their metrics. So hence, uh, they're not able to incorporate ESG or they're not uh, really able to advise on ESG. So again, they also perceive that there's a lack of appetite uh, by the asset owners. So asset owners who are the retail individual uh, investors or could be uh, institutional clients of these advisors. Um, the, the advisors feel that there is not enough appetite. So again, they're not really advising them a lot on um, ESG issues at the moment. So this is uh, one of the challenges that we're seeing. But again, it's very important to make sure that uh, advisors and uh, consultants understand ESG and start advising actively on ESG issues. And uh, there's a lot that the advisors can do. So uh, they can uh, aid the asset owners or the trustees in understanding their fiduciary obligations. So they can help them understand that, yes, your fiduciary obligation is not just financial risk and return, but it also incorporates longer term uh, climate factors and sustainability factors which can impact uh, portfolio performance in the long run. So uh, ESG to incorporate or ESG consideration is a fiduciary duty. Uh, advisors or consultants can make the um, uh, asset owners or trustees aware of this uh, responsibility and then help the asset owners formulate a strategy which is in inclusive of ESG as consultants and advisors to these asset owners, help them draft investment principles and policies uh, in line with that strategy which incorporates ESG. Yeah. So that's what they can do. And once the asset owners have, um, have formulated their strategy, uh, they will also help, consultants often also help the asset owners select a manager. So in their manager selection role, again, the consultants can help the owners design a proposal and formulate a mandate that integrates investment beliefs on ESG as well as expectations on the implementation of ESG from the asset manager. So they can help in framing the guidelines, manager selection, and they can also include the asset manager's capabilities with regards to ESG in the research, screening, selection, and appointment process. So advisors can advise on which asset managers are good or are incorporating ESG better than the others. So again, there's a lot that this community can do and they are an important stakeholder and important to educate them and make them incorporate ESG into their services. Uh, similar is the case with investment platforms like uh, Morningstar or other platforms which are now av available on the internet, which also disseminate advice on funds or collate data on funds, collate data on performance and so on and so forth. And the, the platform's research and recommendation can also be highly influential. So a negative recommendation can drive uh, significant capital away from a particular fund and a positive recommendation can drive capital into the fund. So again, uh, more and more platforms have started, integrated, started integrating or, or started providing ESG ratings uh, within their um, services. And um, 
They can also do a lot like the advisors. They can increase awareness of ESG funds to both retail and institutional investors, and they can help enable easier identification of and the information of these funds. So a lot of times we as individual investors or even institutional investors may not know what choices are available on from an ESG perspective and what exactly are fund managers doing on an ESG perspective. So platforms can help collate all this data and uh, uh, it'll make it easier for asset owners and investors to choose from various ESG platforms. So again, an important stakeholder uh, like uh, consultants, investment platforms. And uh, finally, the third service provider is the fund label labeler. So labels are providing benchmarks and quality guarantees for both practitioners and clients. So if a fund is labeled as scoring good on ESG or good ESG fund or green fund or you know, climate uh, sustainability fund, then that'll, uh, if your fund is rated as a ESG compliant fund, then that'll be good for your fund and vice versa. So again, fund labelers should do a good quality job in ensuring that uh, the labels are actually, or, or the performance or the processes are actually matching the labels that they are giving to the various funds. So again, um, at the moment, uh, multiple countries uh, don't have a similar label, so we are not able to apply it across jurisdictions. But again, uh, these certifications are becoming more and more important and more and more funds want to get these labels or certifications. And a lot of times uh, there has been criticism that these are just marketing tools, whereas actual investments are deviating from these stated purposes or they're not really following these labels. But uh, again, um, uh, more and more or more stringent uh, uh, sort of implementation of these labels or, or certifications or, or will, will, will be good quality guarantees and hence will give people more confidence to invest in their ESG funds knowing that these funds are actually doing what uh, they are stating to or what they are claiming to. So yeah, so that's about the fund services. The next set of stakeholders that we'll study about are the financial services providers. So these are investment banks, or custodial banks, uh, research and advisory firms, stock exchanges, uh, financial and ESG rating agencies, all um, that provide various financial services to the asset managers, asset owners and other stakeholders. Now they play a very important uh, role in the ESG ecosystem as uh, they can provide high quality information uh, about the ESG characteristics uh, uh, and do other services uh, also which can promote the ESG. So investment banks for instance can support companies issuing a green bond, uh, a bond where the proceeds are invested in climate and environmental projects. Sales side analysts and rating agencies can incorporate ESG within their analysis and provide information on the ESG disclosures uh, and also give recommendations and ratings uh, based on these disclosures. Stock exchanges can increase the requirements on disclosure so we have more information available and we have more ESG data, especially by the listed companies that are listed on the stock exchanges as is encouraged by the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. Uh, and similarly, proxy voting service providers. So these, um, Service providers generally help uh, asset owners or asset managers make decisions about whether to vote in favor or against uh, the mandates or the propositions given by the management. So again, uh, they, so they give advice on whether how how the um, investors should vote. So again, they can also integrate ESG considerations within their voting recommendations and, and which can help promote ESG or help companies focus more on uh, ESG initiatives. So that was about the financial services providers. Uh, very importantly, the next set of stakeholders are the policy makers and the regulators. Uh, first, we'll talk about the financial regulators. So financial regulators, generally speaking, have three main objectives. First is to maintain orderly financial markets. Second, and very importantly, is to safeguard the investments, especially of the smaller investors in financial instruments, savings, pensions, and other investment vehicles, so that there is no fraud or people don't run away with your money. And finally, bring about an orderly expansion of the activities of the finance sector. Now, in all these three perspectives, they can incorporate or they can look at ESG factors. So ESG factors can impact all of these, can impact uh, the or stability of financial markets, uh, especially um, things like climate change, et cetera, can have a profound impact or a, a long-term impact on the stability of the financial system. Similarly, investments um, 
in financial instruments, et cetera, will also be safeguarded if there is stability in the long run and uh, climate change and other social factors are taken into consideration. And finally, expansion um, in green bonds and uh, disclosure requirements and ESG characteristics of firms uh, are other mandates that regulators can um, execute so as to promote the ESG agenda. So again, um, this is about what financial regulators can do. Other regulators can also influence the ESG characteristics of the investee companies or the companies by strengthening or, or the matters regarding environmental, so how they conduct their business, the amount of um, gases they emit, uh, the labor hiring practices, the impact on society and communities, the governance uh, disclosures. So they can regulate these activities or they can um, mandate certain requirements and they can also ask for more disclosure. So increasingly, we are seeing that policymakers are responding to the growing urgency of these topics and the stability of the financial system, for instance, can be impacted by climate change, and, uh, you know, good biodiversity, good uh, uh, social systems. And uh, if we have good resources available and more re renewable focus, for instance, will be good for the stability of the overall system. And secondly, again, the risks to the individual investor portfolio from all these uh, risks or all these uh, ESG issues is also include increasingly being considered into policy formulation and regulatory action. Um, so generally, regulations will involve three themes. First will be disclosure. So guidelines on disclosure will come from government or stock exchanges, again, as we discussed, so that uh, companies disclose more information on the material ESG risks. And again, this will not impose a requirement, but again, if we have the data available, we can incorporate these risks into our decisions or as, as asset managers or as asset, asset owners. Again, the regulation can be on stewardship that um, as owners of uh, companies or as shareholders, uh, then we should have regular interaction with, with our investee companies and ask them questions on uh, the um, ESG factors uh, to promote the health and stability of the market. So again, stewardship codes are also uh, voluntary, but uh, more and more mandatory regulation is uh, being recently approved on um, stewardship and how you should interact with your uh, investee companies and ask for more information on ESG issues. Uh, finally, regulation could be on asset owners. Again, uh, typically pension funds, insurance companies, et cetera, requiring them to integrate ESG and disclose the process and outcome of the ESG integration into their uh, investment portfolios or investment mandates. So again, um, People are also, so generally it used to be for pension funds, but increasingly insurance market and all are also being brought under this regulation to consider climate risk and other relevant ESG factors. So again, policymakers and regulators can also have a, a profound impact on promoting ESG. And uh, a lot of the regulation we find is more recent and uh, European Union is um, ahead of the other countries, but again, Asia and uh, other regions are also catching up. In 2016, People's Bank of China issued guidelines establishing the green financial system. So again, this was a turning point for the sustainable finance policy. So again, uh, previous reforms were more reactive in nature, but uh, increasingly regulators are, rea are realizing that uh, in order to avert a disaster, a policy has to be more forward looking and uh, the risks uh, of the future also need to be identified and incorporated today. Uh, again, uh, North America, for instance, the um, policies are more voluntary, that is either comply or given an explanation as to why you are not complying. But increasingly, we are seeing that we will be moving away from comply or explain to comply and explain. So you have to comply and also give an explanation of how you have managed to comply rather than a voluntary um, a mandate as of now. Again, voluntary will move to more mandatory and a recommended policy will see more implementation and more re reporting on that policy uh, going forward. Um, many examples uh, of this uh, increased regulation and increased policy initiatives on the ESG front. Uh, uh, we will talk uh, particularly about the European Union taxonomy regulation so this was formulated in 22, uh, on June 2020, and uh, this states the conditions for an economic activity to be considered environmentally sustainable. 
So an economic activity or a business will be considered sustainable if it contributes substantially to at least one of the environmental objectives, uh, does no significant harm to any other environmental objective, and complies with the minimum social and governance safeguards. And what are these environmental objectives? So the six environmental objectives are first, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, sustainable use of protection and protection of water and marine resources, the transition to a circular economy, so a sustainable economy, economy that can self uh, uh, work within itself, pollution prevention, and the protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystem. So it must contribute to at least one of these factors without harming any of the other factors with minimum social and governance standards. So again, um, more and more regulation is coming, which uh, will help this or, or for companies to be able to claim that they are environmentally sustainable or are activities are sustainable. They will have to prove uh, with data and, and do more activities which are actually in that regard or a step forward in the right direction. Uh, we can also talk about the task, task, task force on climate related financial disclosures. So again, and we'll study more of this in the environmental section. But again, the TCFT recommendation center on four key areas, that is governance, strategy, risk management, and climate-related metrics and targets. So again, um, uh, the recommendations are that firms should disclose information and support capital allocation on these or along these climate-related areas. Again, challenges to uh, ESG investing can uh, emerge if regulators hold a narrow interpretation, as we've seen with uh, uh, many regulators, uh, like, for instance, the U.S. Department of Labor's 2020 ruling on fiduciary duty, which says that fiduciary duty may not necessarily involve a non-financial objective. And you can go through the case study in more detail uh, in the coming slides. But again, if uh, regulators take a narrow approach of just risk and return and financial return and profit, then again, uh, the ESG related targets uh, may be defeated. So yeah, that's something uh, that is a challenge that we need to be aware of. But more and more regulators are recognizing the importance of ESG to financial stability and including that in their regulation. So yeah, we can go through some of the case studies. Uh, US, UK, again, uh, on fiduciary duties. Uh, European Union, which is making it more mandatory as against the US and the UK. And even China, which is uh, increasing more guidelines on green investments, as we, as we discussed. And the next relevant stakeholders are the investees or the investee companies themselves. So actually, these includes not just companies, but all entities in which investments can be made. So these can be the corporates or the companies that um, you lend to or you buy equity of uh, or, you're sh uh, or you become a shareholder of. So the investee companies in which you're investing, the could be projects such as infrastructure projects or joint ventures, could even be agencies, for instance, the World Bank, International Finance and Finance Corporations, who also raise uh, debt and uh, uh, other instruments, uh, who also raise money so you can invest in these agencies. And you can invest in sovereign bonds or you can invest in countries, municipalities uh, and other jurisdictions as well. So investees are the companies wherein you invest and they are required to disclose and focus on ESG issues. So the executives of these entities influence how they manage ESG risks and the impact that their business activities have on the environment and society. So they decide on the level of disclosure of the ESG factors uh, to existing as well as potential investors. So again, one of the most pressing issues uh, that we will discuss and we have discussed is a lack of information and uh, lack of reliable information. So again, uh, if they report uh, honestly and thoroughly on ESG factors, then again, um, this issue can be addressed and we will have better information available to invest in these companies. So investees are definitely very important stakeholders in the ESG investing uh, market. Uh, next, we move on to the government. So 
again, now we're not talking about um, uh, government per se, but we're saying how the governments think of ESG investing or how the governments realize that the investment industry can 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 play a very important role in the uh, in sustainable investments or in achieving positive outcomes for the society. So what the government now realizes is that the investment industry is very necessary to drive this ESG agenda and to drive this change. That's why we have this course on ESG investing. So social security systems and public pensions, which are funded by the government, are in predicament in many countries. So the governments know that they may not be able to pay the pensions themselves. So the citizens are increasingly turning to these corporates or private investments and private pension plans for financial stability. So these private pension plans have a lot of money and hence this money should be invested in a responsible manner and in a sustainable manner or towards driving a sustainable economy. So many countries uh, need to build or restore, re restore public infrastructure because public infrastructure is getting old. It was uh, set up decades ago, in many cases, even more than a century ago. So governments alone cannot fund this so they will need the private investments and and uh, responsible investing to rebuild this infrastructure and do it in a sustainable manner governments have also recognized that a transition to a low carbon economy will require significant shifts in capital so we will have in, new investments in re renewable new investments in technology new investments um, uh, uh, which will require capital so again responsible the investment industry is needed and again if the investment industry considers uh, ESG and social and environmental impact of their investments, then again, it will help advance these priorities or advance these ESG priorities. So that's um, what the government has uh, realized uh, from an ESG perspective. And finally, and very importantly, the civil society and the academy have also played a very important role in developing the ESG ecosystem. So civil society, including NGOs, uh, are increasing uh, requirements or demanding more sustainability at a company level and they're demanding more transparency and consideration around the impact that the investment is having on society and the environment so again these ngos partner with investment firms they're partnering with regulators to improve understanding of esg matters and a lot of them are helping to bring into to light actions that are are, are insufficient to address the global challenges or many a times people are claiming to be ESG compliant and they're doing things like greenwashing so they're getting a label of uh, an ESG compliant fund but they're not actually investing in a responsible manner or they're actually not focusing on uh, what they claim to be doing so again uh, NGOs and all they, they, they sometimes help bring to light these issues and academic research similarly has been very influential in, uh, in in validating the business case for integrating ESG. So more and more research has shown that integrating ESG has actually been profitable and companies that are performing well on ESG metrics have better stock price performance and and portfolios would have done better if, if they had focused on a properly in integrating ESG analysis. So again, this academia and uh, these studies are uh, very important in uh, promoting and growing ESG considerations. Uh, so that's about the second review on the ESG market and uh, we'll wind up by solving some more questions. Uh, so thanks a lot and uh, see you next time.